Welcome to the Jewish World. I am Rabbi Elchanan Pupko. We are here with the one and only Ambassador Professor Michael Oren, a former member of the Israeli Knesset, former Ambassador of Israel to the United States. He taught at Harvard, Yale, Georgetown, and many other prestigious institutions. Uh, world famous for many, many things, but uh, it, his books are bestsellers. So uh, we're here in, to hear from you on all of these uh, in all of these capacities. Thank you. Thank you. What a warm welcome to that. All right. So, so let's just, uh, in, in context of where we are now, dive right into it. You're also above every all of your positions. You're a man of history, a historian. Uh, where do you see the Jewish people at? We're on the eve of Tisha B'Av. We've seen the scenes of division, the rift in Israel. Uh, what are you optimistic about, pessimistic about? What are your thoughts in terms of history? I'm certainly pessimistic in the short run. Um, and specifically with the, the lead up to Tisha B'Av. And uh, what we've learned from Tisha B'Av, what we've taught ourselves for thousands of years, is that uh, the destruction of our temples and our exile from our land were the product of Sinat Chinam, of, you know, of I guess, gratuitous uh, hatred, would be a good, uh, good, good translation, between Jews. And what we've seen now in the lead up to Tisha B'Av this year is gratuitous hatred. Uh, all around. Um, yesterday or two days ago, I was very disturbed by a, a photograph that appeared in the Israeli press of members of the coalition taking a selfie after uh, after the vote. And I said, you know, it wouldn't have been much better. I understand how ardently these these members of the coalition feel about their uh, about the legislation, but couldn't they take into consideration that there are hundreds of thousands of Israelis for whom this is extremely painful, and not to not to be triumphant about it. Not to smile for the cameras, because there's nothing to smile about here. The country is deeply divided. Our security is impaired. Our international relations, uh, many of them, particularly with the United States, are rather shredded. And the most important thing is that our national unity, our sense of national purpose, has been uh, greatly damaged at a time of mounting threats to our security and, poten and potentially even our existence. And that's where you get Sinat Chinam, because while the, you know, the Romans were surrounding the city in the year 70, uh, Jews inside the city were, were slaughtering one another. And here we have a situation that's roughly analogous, that the uh, Jews here are not slaughtering one another, at least not yet, on the boat, but we are fighting bitterly. And outside our walls are not the Romans anymore, but the Iranians, who are literally surrounding us with tens and tens of thousands of rockets, and they're using those rockets to deter us from deterring them from acquiring military nuclear weapons. So it, there is a very strong historical parallel. So that's what I feel in the short run. Um, in the long run, I have a, a deep belief in Netzach Yisrael. I have a deep belief in, um, in the Jewish people and our ability to surmount existential crises. And that uh, I have a personal view. I've been here for 45 years and I've seen us overcome truly insurmountable obstacles. I have a historical view of what it was like this country in 1948 when we were created and we overcame all that. So you can't have those type of perspectives and not at some level feel in the long term, turn there's hope. Wow. And so as a historian, not only of Jewish history, but also of the state of Israel, where do you see this division? Meaning we've seen uh, th there was the Irgun and the Haganah. We've seen Menachem Begin over the German uh, uh, reconciliation with the... Uh, we've seen divisions, the Sinai, uh, uh, when uh, they gave uh, Sinai back to Egypt and uh, Oslo, etc. Where does this fall? Why do some people feel like this is unprecedented? Is this just Jews fighting as usual? Where, what, what are we looking at? There are several aspects of it that, that certainly distinguish it from almost everything you mentioned. Um, one is let's let's look at the regional context. Um, our Arab neighbors. Uh, they have got a lot of chutzpah with those Arab neighbors. They had the gall to make peace with us. And by making peace with us, they removed an external pressure that kept the society together. We didn't have too much time to bicker with one another because we had to fight a common enemy. Now that enemy's made peace, most of them, certainly close to us. So that was one. Um, there are widening social gaps in this country. We have the, after the United States, Chile, and Mexico, we have the widest and deepest social gap between rich and poor of any country in the world. Wow. We have a million, million children beneath the poverty line. This is a time when Israel's per capita GDP is surpassing that of Japan. Uh, we've already we've already surpassed Germany, Britain, we've just surpassed them. Mm -hmm. um, 
but that's because a small percentage of the population, 12, 30 percent from involved in high tech are doing very, very well. And the rest of the country isn't. And this has ramifications also for uh, for the geographical dispersion of the Israeli people. OK, because the, the wealth is concentrated in the greater Tel Aviv area, mm -hmm. uh, but not in the periphery. And if you look, where are all the demonstrations taking place? Not many of them are taking place in Kirat Shmona. Not many of them are taking place in, mm -hmm. in Nitivot. Well, you have King. the Kibbutzim a little bit, but yeah. Yeah, the Kibbutzim were up north. I know that. But really, the Kirat Shmona itself, um, you know, does uh, Ma'alot have a big protest going on? I, I, I kind of doubt it. Um, and then there is the continuing ethnic divide in this country. Now, my, my mother, who's 95, was always fond of saying during her professional years as a, as a family therapist, she was fond of saying that um, the presenting problem is not the problem. And so the presenting problem here would be the reform. And there's a dear, there's a serious problem here. We'll get into what the problems are with that. But beneath it are deep uh, ethnic divides and religious divides. So um, I wrote a, an article for the Times of Israel yesterday. I saw it where I talked yeah, about I my, my two Israels. I, I'm, I was, a, I was always, I've been a rower for many years and mm -hmm. uh and i row out of a boathouse on the arkham the arkham river in the north of tel aviv and all the members of that boathouse are you know ashkenazi professionals uh, secular and who uh, who protest and um but i'm also a member of a, a kila here in jaffa uh ziklon Baal. it's a great place and uh which is made up of young people mostly mizrahi mm -hmm. and um and conservative religions many people are working class and they don't see this whole situation as a matter of, you know, democracy and rights. They see it as a matter of sort of a an Ashkenazi elite rallying around the last bastion of Ashkenazi elite power, which is the Supreme mm -hmm. Court, and um, and their refusal of that elite to relinquish the power that they they lost at the polls. Mm -hmm. That's the way they see it. And I encounter this every day. Uh, I talk about this 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 great division, this schism. In perceptions and in, in interests, it, it, that is what's disturbing. Um, I would just add one thing. Perhaps the deepest division we have is, is between what I call the normal and abnormal Israel. Mm -hmm. okay, so the normal Israel is the Israel that um, was envisioned by many of the uh, founding fathers and mothers of this country. They wanted Israel to be a normal state. You know, we want to be a Jewish state like Belgium is Belgium, like Ireland is Irish. And what did that mean? It meant that, okay, we're going to have Hebrew language, we're going to have Jewish holidays, a Jewish calendar. But other than that, we're going to be like a Middle Eastern suite. We're going to have mm -hmm. equal rights, great beaches, great food, cu culture, uh, rule of law. That's the normal Israel. The abnormal Israel is the, the abnormal Israel that says, you know, 4,000 years ago, Hashem came to Abraham and said, guess what? You're not going to be normal. You're going to be, and, and what has distinguished the Jewish people for 4,000 years is our abnormality. <laughs> We're not like other peoples. And that group of Israelis will say, well, when we have a state, why would we want to be normal? We want to be Jewish. We want to be abnormal. And I don't think you can get a deeper division of that. So, you know, between all these uh, groups, uh, two things. Number one is, uh, in many ways, to me, it looks like Israel is assimilating to the region, not in a good way. Uh, you see these tribal fights in Iraq, yeah. Lebanon, sure. Egypt. Uh, and so the question is, is that is that where Israel is going? And secondly, if it is really demographics, is there any way out of this? So once you have that tribalism, like we've seen in Iraq and Lebanon, uh, what's the way out? Well, we say this, that the Israeli society has become more Eastern in its culture. All you have mm -hmm. to do is listen to Israeli pop stations. Yeah. I listened to them 30, 40 years ago, and all the music sounded like the Beach Boys. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, more and more bad, the music sounds like something that could have been made in Cairo and Damascus. Uh, we've become very Middle Eastern in certain ways, but we haven't become, we hadn't become Middle Eastern in our politics. And that's becoming increasingly Middle Eastern as well now. And um, the way forward is through dialogue. It's the only way, it's the only way. When I was ambassador, I presided over a program of tishes. Uh, there were nine consul generals in the United States. I asked each of them to hold a tish. And around that tish would mm -hmm. sell Jews from different branches of Judaism, different perspectives. And it really worked. The Jews really, were very successful. People didn't agree. Don't get me wrong. They didn't agree, but they had never met one. They never really discussed this normally. 
So um, if I may, I'll plug my new book, which is um, it's called Israel 2048. The Virginia oh, wow. And uh, it's interesting because it's in English, but it's also in Hebrew. Um, oh, one. wow. And inside, so for it's, one. In, it's, in, it's in Arabic. It's three for one. And uh, for those of you who want to read Arabic. So this is a, um, a project that I began several years ago in coordinated coordination with the prime minister. I was the deputy in the prime minister's mm -hmm. office. And um, I had a conversation one night saying, you know, how can we never talk about our future? Anymore? We're so bogged down in current events. We never mm -hmm. get a chance to really talk about our future. I said, let's put together a state commission that will examine Israel on its 100th birthday, 2048. What kind of state we want to see in terms of education, social policy, foreign policy, Jewish policy, Palestinians, mm -hmm. you name it. We got very excited and we began to put together this commission, which is uh, legally very complex. And by the time we got all the paperwork done, the government fell. I, so, um, I moved the discussion of 2048 into the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem with my good friend, Nathan Saransky. And it was a fabulous discussion, very illuminating. And then Corona hit. And uh, so I retreated to this office, wherever you are, and I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. Um, and people got interested in the book and they formed an NGO. I, I didn't form it called uh, 2048, the second century. And the purpose of the book, the purpose of the NGO is to get people talking. So the book has, has my vision in it, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily your vision. And uh, I'm not asking anybody, I'm not asking to convince anybody. What I want to do is tweak them. I want to challenge them to get into a discussion, probably young people. Because you know, I don't know if I'm going to be around in 2048, but they would be. God willing. A good health. God. Um, and the last point is this. So one of the chapters that I wrote, I guess, three, four years ago, is on the need for reforming the Supreme Court. And I suggested ways that could be done. Now, I'm not a prophet, but I could see that this was going to blow up. Mm -hmm. And there are other issues that I see that can blow up. And if we don't start discussing them now, we're going to hit the same problem. You know, you mentioned uh, your instructions to ambassadors, and, and I must say the first time I heard you speak was uh, at an APAC uh, co rabbis conference, a summer conference. I don't know if you remember it, uh, but it was it had it was uh, during the whole Iran uh, deal saga. Yeah. And they had, by the way, they had a every community in America was connected except for Houston. When you declared Houston, we've got a problem. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, but uh, it was really funny. Uh, but yeah, no, it was uh, Joe Lieberman was there. Uh, Charles Krautheimer was there. Uh, and and uh, I, I guess y you really excelled in, in bringing Jews together. You're, you're a very respected voice in, in every corner of the Jewish world. Uh, your successor made a statement that uh, later became very famous or infamous, uh, no. Ron Dermer said, ambassador in Washington, said in a Makorishon conference that Israel should be investing more time in cultivating relationships with evangelicals. And if anything, they were Israeli foreign ministry is spending too much time on uh, Jews. I was just last week in Washington. There was the Kufi conference, and I heard someone also mentioned it there. Uh, and you and may have been misquoted, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I watched that clip, the clip many, 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 many times over. But uh. It's actually a school of thought. It's a broader school of thought. Um, two schools of thought, right? Um, it's the same division between about Israel's relationship with the American Jewish community as it is with Israel's relationship with Congress. And I'll explain. Mm -hmm. So one school of thought thinks that we have to maintain Jewish unity at almost any price. That if a, a Jew considers herself himself a Jew who believes that Israel has a right to exist, they have to be embraced, even if they disagree on policies. The other school says it's too late. We've lost these people. No matter what we do, uh, we're never going to be acceptable to them. They're always going to be hypercritical. And that if we have limited resources, we should invest it in our base, people support mm -hmm. us, whether it's evangelical Christians or Orthodox Jews. The same school says that we should that that bipartisan support for Israel in Congress is a paramount strategic interest for us. But another school says it's too late. Bipartisanship is dead, 
And so we, if we have limited resources, we should invest it in our base in Congress. Get mm -hmm. it? The same, the same division. And and would you just first first of all, I I'll confess here and disclose that I I was very distraught by the statement. I I've uh, criticized him publicly several times about it, but. If anything, would you say that the events of the past half a year, uh, Netanyahu not being invited and, and the chilling of relationships, would you say that that disproves uh, this theory of, of Dermer or not? Um, just thoughts in, in, in terms of years later, how has it worked out? Or prove it. What it does show is that it's much harder, and it has been for a long time, at least a decade, to adhere to the first school. You are on the you have to, the, the burden of proof is on the first school. Prove to me that preserving parts of say liberal American Jewry, mm -hmm. which is a, are not lost. Uh, prove to me that bipartisan support for Israel is not a lost cause. Prove to me because there's so much evidence that's mounting up to the contrary. And my position is that even though there's a, a you know there's a mounting amount of evidence on on the other side of the second. On the second school, that doesn't mean we should abandon the first. Let me give you a little example. Um, our good friend, uh, Brett Stevens, a great champion of, of, of Israel, of, of free thought, of freedom, nothing but superlatives to say about Brett. He published an article in the New York Times, oh, I don't know how many months ago, where he said um, the pro-Israel community should abandon American campuses because it's a lost cause. And we should stop fighting that battle. And my position was, maybe it is a lost battle, but that doesn't mean we can give it up. Mm -hmm. First of all, we have students on those campuses who are fighting for Israel. We can't abandon them. can't leave them. And if we abandon one field, what's next? Because the enemy is going to say, hey, we kicked them off campuses. Let's see what we can kick them out of next. Maybe mm -hmm. out of business communities. So, you know, there are some battles you have to fight, even though the chances of winning are very slim or perhaps even non-existent. And it's what I feel about our relationship with American Jewry and what I feel about our relationship with Congress. We are the Jewish state of Israel. We are not Belgium. We are not Ireland. And that means that we have a moral duty to our history, to Jewish history, to Jewish peoplehood that transcends pure strategic or economic interests. And I, I, that is that is a guiding principle for me. In so many different areas, I, you probably don't even have time to hear them all. But it's, a, but it's a guiding principle that we are just not a normal country in that way, mm -hmm. as much as we'd like to be, nor should we be. Look, I, I, I cannot agree more with you, but what I would say is that even without the morals, just in terms of the, the, the pragmatic outcome, it does seem like that was a wrong prediction, meaning the fact that you see uh, that the evangelical base is not rallying around Netanyahu now, that he he's still not really, uh, it, it does seem to be disproven. So yeah, will evangelicals- I that's true though. I'm sorry for cutting off, but I, I, saw, that, I saw they just had a big uh, Republican pro-Israel conference and all the, all the candidates showed up and it wasn't sure. a word of <laughs> but, re about, but Republicans yeah. are not in charge now. And, uh, you know, yeah. I said I said it's ironic because when David Ben-Gurion came to New York in 1948, there were a million Jews out in the streets. And if Netanyahu came now, there would probably be Jews protesting. I would say there'd be a million Jews out in the street. But <laughs> exactly. Not, not greeting him. Not greeting him. Yeah. yeah. So so yeah. In, in that sense, yeah, sure. Uh, Netanyahu is still popular in Nebraska, but not in D.C. Uh, so in that sense, I think that the pragmatism has also been miscalculated well yes and um well you're seeing it from different reasons you're saying the evangelicals haven't rallied around us i say that you know the democrats haven't exactly rallied around us either i have very strong opinions about all of these issues you can imagine um mm -hmm. i have um rubbed some feathers the wrong way russell's a bit of the wrong way by saying that american jews should not be out there protesting about Israel, that uh, american mm -hmm. jews don't pay the taxes don't serve in the military mm -hmm. uh, and their kids aren't serving in the military. And frankly, mm -hmm. America shouldn't be exactly be preaching democracy to any other country, right? That's <laughs> we haven't true. had a, we, we have not had an attempted insurrection. Correct. In that yet. is true. Or yeah, as of yet, we have a large body of people who refuse to accept the outcome of the election. I'd be yes. a little humble, a little bit humble about preaching. A hundred percent. Um, but um 
And I also have criticism of the way that President Biden has handled this. I mm-hmm. think it's a, I think it's a dangerous game he's playing. And um, I have great respect for him. I work mm-hmm. very close with him um, and like him. What, what do you mean? You mean the fact that he's not inviting Netanyahu or the fact that he's taking a position or, or what do you think is a mistake? I think first, he's, he has, he has every right not to invite anybody who doesn't want to invite him, certainly. And that mm-hmm. includes the, the president, the prime minister of Israel. It's making it public, mm-hmm. which is a mistake. It's always been a mistake. It was a mistake that Obama made again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And he's repeating that mistake. And what happens with that mistake is two things. One is it gives our enemies the wrong impression that there's a deep rift and they will mm-hmm. take advantage of it. Okay. Um, and we've had provocations from Hezbollah in the north. And I would I would ascribe some of these provocations mm-hmm. directly to the sense that Hezbollah sees the rift. It's also backfiring. Um, in fact, when Biden comes out and criticizes the prime minister and says, I'm not going to invite him, it actually increases Netanyahu's numbers. Mm-hmm. So he's not doing the demonstrators any, any great favor. And, uh, and I also think it's bad for America, not just because America could get dragged into a war in this region, but because other allies in the world are perhaps asking themselves if this is the way he treats a democratically elected leader of a very close ally, hey, maybe we're next. So it, it, it doesn't strengthen America's credibility in the world. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. I will never forget, as ambassador, meeting secretly with Palestinian representatives. And I said, why aren't you joining the peace talks? You've got the most pro-Palestinian president in history. Why aren't you joining the peace talks? And what they said shocked me. They said, we can't trust anybody who betrays their allies publicly. Wow. How about that? You know, the world sees things differently than maybe other people do. Right. Um, you know, the, a lot of the relationship is built on on the, the being an ally and, and democratic values. What do you say to the people in Washington concerned that Israel is flirting with China, uh, that Netanyahu is too close with Putin? Is there some kind of shift here in terms of alliance uh, where Israel is looking elsewhere? And the answer to that is yes and no. And the yes part of it is, you know, I would often say to Netanyahu, uh, we owe President Obama a great thank you. And he looked at me kind of perplexed. I said, I said, we owe him thank you for kicking us out of the nest. You know, mm-hmm. for several generations, we were in that nice nest of the United States. Mm-hmm. And we never had to really exert ourselves, never had to flap our wings. And he kicked us out. And so as a result of that, Netanyahu went to China, he went to Japan, he went to South America. No prime minister of Israel, believe it or not, had ever been south of the Rio Grande. Wow. Before Netanyahu went to South South, Central South America, uh, to Africa several times. I mean, he we diversified our portfolio. He's mixing Mm -hmm. metaphors. We diversified foreign policy. And we made increasingly close relations with China. Now the the Chinese relationship is particularly dicey and complex. It's because uh, China is investing very heavily in our region. It's made ports all around our regions. It is building the subway across my house here. It's building wow. the ports. Um, half the, the cranes in this in Tel Aviv have Chinese signs on them. Wow. Um, and if you get up in the morning in my neighborhood, it looks like Shanghai. A lot of guys on wow. bicycles, yellow helmets, really. Um, and so strategically, economically, I think I saw one statistic that China has actually surpassed the United States as a trading partner. Which, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. And so can we afford to ignore all that at a time when America is withdrawing from our region? That's one. On the other hand, the yes and no, the China doesn't share our vote. China is not going to vote with us in the UN. China is supporting some of our, our deadliest enemies, right? Um, so no one, no power can replace the United States as our ultimate ally. Mm-hmm. Um, the big question is, okay, do we have to be 100% beholden to that alliance? Um, I have sat through meetings now with three administrations, different parties, but they have excoriated us for our relationship with China. And they have said things like, if the Chinese build a, Hi- a Haifa port, the Sixth Fleet won't visit Haifa. Mm-hmm. Not happy with us. Yeah, I mean, they are, they are worried and uh, concerned that, you know, between Netanyahu's closeness to Russia the uh, developments with China and then the decline of democracy within Israel, according to you know the, the common perception, there is this concern in Washington uh, that that there's that there the countries are drifting apart. 
I think, but we're not the only country that's drifting apart from the United States. It's the United States that's also drifting. And it's, it's, it's the isolationism, which mm -hmm. is, is truly a bipartisan issue. <laughs> it's because the Republicans yes, are Democrats that's true. together. Mm -hmm. And they're rare that, that no, but no, everyone's tired of being the policeman of the, of the world. Um, no one wants to get involved in another foreign war. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Israel, Germany, Japan, South Korea, many other countries with all the same interests, which is a strong, confident, and power projecting country. I've often said that I would prefer to have a president in the White House who's critical of Israel, but who is willing to and able to project power over a, a prime minister who gets up in the morning and sings Hatikva, <laughs> mm -hmm. but is unwilling to project power. Right. It's more important for us. Uh, you, you mentioned several times working with Netanyahu and uh, like Tom Friedman wrote and, and many in Israel have been noting uh, what happened to the man, meaning the man who was perceived as the most rational, calculated, uh, forward thinking prime minister, which is the, the person you knew. Uh, full disclosure, I uh, once when I was in Israel, I'm an Israeli citizen, I voted for him. What happened to him in the sense that you see the Israeli economy declining? You see, I think, 56% uh, of Israelis see a civil war coming. 28% uh, are thinking of leaving. Is the man the same man? I think time has taken this poll. Um, but also politics. He is in the weakest position I can never remember him being in politically. And it's now likes to be in the center of his coalitions likes to have parties to the right of him, right as the left of him. He now finds himself being pretty much the leftmost person in his own coalition. And everybody's got a gun to his head. Everyone's saying, if you don't do exactly what I want you to do, I'm going to blow this up. I'm going to pull mm -hmm. the trigger. And, um, you know, with his trial in the background, he wants to remain in the office of the prime minister as long as these trials continue, because uh, it definitely increases his chances. Um, and you know, so it, it is, he is a weak, much weaker prime minister than what we've known. I served in two, in two uh, Netanyahu governments that were very stable. We, we, we almost mm -hmm. never had a crisis. And um, look back at some of the crises we have, they're almost laughable compared mm -hmm. to these. Um, so that's, that, that will do it. That will certainly do it. And, and do you think that he has the character of seeing at, at some point that, uh, okay, this is uh, causing too much damage or stepping down, or will it be a Putin-style, uh, Erdogan-style, you know, let it all burn as long as I stay in power? <laughs> you know, I had a wonderful professor once, Asher Aryan, Allah Shalom, who was the, an American Israeli who was the first sort of scholar of Israeli politics, political scientist. And he, mm -hmm. I once asked him in that, like a Hillel-like fashion, if you had to teach you, if you have one thing you can teach me about Israeli politics, what do I have to know? And he smiled and said, uh, Israeli politicians always prefer collective to individual suicide. Oh, my. That's frightening. And you, and you see it playing out now because what, what's happened with Benny Gantz and Lapid, they could join a national unity government. But no, we'd rather let the whole place burn down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we'll come back and pick up the pieces later. And uh, collective and individual suicide. Um where does that leave us? I think it leaves us in a very precarious situation. Very precarious. Wow. Look, yeah. A lot of this uh, discussion has also been about demographics. And mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that in the beginning. The demographics in Israel do not seem to be changing. And so with the trajectory of Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, uh, taking a larger and larger part of the population, uh, the, the, the kind of secular Israelis that you mentioned, at the heart of high tech and uh, that we've seen traditionally leading the country uh, kind of in a decline proportionally. Is there something that uh, you mentioned dialogue as a solution, but there's nothing that's going to stop the demographics. So you mentioned 2048. Uh, where does this go all go demographically speaking? Demographically will be a lot less important if um, certain policies are, perform are, 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 are pursued. By the way, none of this is rocket science, I'm about to tell you. Mm -hmm. Most of it has to do with just enforcing laws. You know, the Knesset passed about 4,000 pieces of legislation a year. We have one of the highest rates of, of legislation, but we have one of the lowest rates of enforcement. Mm -hmm. Only 35% of our laws are enforced. 
So in the book, 2048, I talk a lot about the Bedouin and how upwards of 30% of the Bedouin male have more than one li- wives. Polygamy, even though wow. polygamy is illegal in the state of Israel. What are the ramifications of that? It's just mm-hmm. immense. But we also have a, a Haredi education system that's not teaching young people anything beyond second grade math and English. So these young people, um, you know, forget about not serving in the army. They can't integrate in the economy. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you scoot ahead 25 years from now when almost at one out of every two elementary school students in this country will be Haredi. That's a prescription for unsustainability. It's, it's the state simply won't be sustainable. Mm-hmm. And those who you know, who can believe. And um, they simply won't put up with that. So the, the answer to this is, is to give Haredi young people education and integrate them in the workforce. And hopefully the Israeli Haredi will have enough self-confidence, and I stress that, uh, to say, okay, people can be doctors and lawyers and professionals without changing their lifestyle. No one wants to change their lifestyle. Um mm-hmm. And I've worked with, uh, I was the first Israeli ambassador to meet secretly with the Haredi leadership of the United States. I had some extraordinary meetings with us. And I learned a tremendous amount. Um, learned that there is no Haredi community. There are Haredi communities um, with different opinions. But some of these communities graduate hundreds of lawyers and doctors every year. And people That's, say Haredi. It, and, and, you know. The yeshiva I went to in Queens, probably never heard of it. I think we had a higher Ivy League placement rate than Brooklyn College and, and some of the big uh, colleges in New York because, you know, the kids had had uh, got their yeshiva education and then they did their best to get into law school, dental school. Some even went to medical right. school. But of yeah, course. of course, the American model is a great model and we have to adopt it. We have to get out of this cycle where the government pays Haredi leadership to keep their populations in what in modern terms is ignorance and dependence. And it becomes a vicious circle. And we have to break that circle. It's not rocket science. It is a matter of, I think it's of sovereignty. I think that, uh, you know, we talk about on Tishbev losing our sovereignty. But for mm-hmm. 2,000 years, we didn't have sovereignty. And the Jewish mm-hmm. people forgot what was actually involved in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, what does it mean? You can't have a completely separate school system that doesn't meet any type of modern standards for a huge chunk of the population. That's not sovereignty. It's a meltdown of sovereignty. But, but if Israel wasn't able to enforce that with the current demographics because of the political power they yield, yeah. is that ever going to happen? It just someone has to actually make it. It'll happen when there's a grassroots um, movement about it. And I think that's already mm-hmm. happened. There's a lot of there's a lot of potential good that can come out of this situation. We never mm-hmm. talk about that. One is the awareness now of other issues that are potentially existentially threatening to the country. Haredi mm-hmm. issue is one of them. The Bedouin is another one. Um, there's, a, there's a general political awakening, and that's not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Wow. All right, Professor Michael Oren, you know, it's uh, it, it, we're on the eve of Tisha B'Av. You're going to have to go soon to uh, Shul to hear the keynote, but uh, it's a mixture, just like the day, there's this mixture of uh, challenges and difficulties and what to lament, but uh, you're offering a lot of optimism. I guess uh, l- last word is, do you think that we're splitting into, uh, you, you know, the state of Israel as being an orthodox country where non-Orthodox Jews don't feel like they can live and uh, the diaspora uh, in another direction? Or will there always be room for different types of Jews uh, to live side by side? Well, again, history's on my side. And, uh, you know, we have coexisted with a highly kaleidoscopic uh, society uh, for 75 years. And we've done not bad, really. By any international standards, Israel is not a successful country. It's a super successful country. And um, so we know that we can do it. We have to get back to that place mm-hmm. where we can talk, where we can exchange ideas, where we can respect one another's differences, but always keep in mind our, our communality, that we do belong to the same people. We do share the same history. We do share the same fate and destiny. Um, once you do that, hmm, you know what it feels like. You know what it feels like to be in a foreign country and you walk into a room of Jews you've never met before and somehow you're home? Yes, yes. I think it was the London airport or something. It was switching over to the uh, Elal line. It's like uh, sometimes it can feel good. Yeah, it's mishpocha. We are yeah. mishpocha. Sometimes a very dysfunctional and rambunctious. 
as mishpachot can be. But we have that, and um, we have to we have to regain it and cherish it and preserve it. Wow. All right, Professor Michael Lauren on the uh, eve of eve of Tish above. Uh, thank, you. thank you, and Ambassador. I am in awe of everything you've done, and uh, I'm sure that uh, you will keep doing. So thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye.